I'm going to cover a lot of ground in this video. We're going to do alignment of various VCRs using a scope because I was asked by someone about that, about how he goes about finding test points. So we're going to find some test points, hook up the scope, do tape path alignment, just show you how it's done. We're going to do it on a bunch of different machines and uh, try to keep it interesting. And I'm going to cover all of them. VHS, 8mm, Beta, we're going to cover them all. Today I'm going to do a, a, I hope it's going to be a short video. It could be a long one. I don't know. I don't know how many machines I'm going to actually look at, look at in this presentation. But I'm going to do a video on VHS VCRs and maybe even some beta VCRs. I haven't decided quite yet. But um, one thing for sure, we're going to look at multiple VCRs. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at alignment using a scope. Now I've done videos before where we just do an alignment using a monitor. I did one specifically on aligning a VHS VCR without using a scope. And I had someone ask me about how do I do one using a scope. So I'm going to try a couple different machines here because what we look for is we look for the RF output from the head amplifier. And it's in different places on different machines. So I'm going to grab a few VCRs that I've got around the shop and we're going to find the appropriate test point, connect the scope up, and I'll sh I have run a second camera here today over my shoulder that's going to be showing the the scope, so we can see what I'm doing, and I'll I'll run the second camera when I'm doing the alignment, so you can see what I'm doing in real time, and um, hopefully it gives you some insight on how to do this. Now, before we start, the scope I'm using is an analog scope. If you've gone out and bought a digital scope you probably won't get good results. And the reason I say that is unless you have a very expensive digital scope, they are not going to display the waveform worth crap. I have a UNI-T 100 megahertz, one gig of, what is it, one GS per second, one gig of sample per second. It cannot do alignment worth crap completely unusable and most of the digital scopes that are not in the four digit price range are going to deliver exactly the same as this unity piece of crap that I have uh, had I known that I would have saved my 500 bucks or whatever I paid for it and not bought it but I kind of bought it because my old Iwatsu scope had blown a, a, a high voltage tripler and uh, I needed a scope, and it was before I was able to track down the Tektronics, which was so uh, generously donated by a, a viewer. It still ended up costing me a, a pile of money, though, because uh, when it was shipped in, I brought it through, uh, I had to bring it in to Canada. I had it shipped to the States. This is before the pandemic, before the borders and everything shut down. I brought it back, and even though it didn't cost me anything other than I paid the freight, I had... Uh, uh, Richard, don't call me dickhead. At the border, who said, what do you got there? I said, oh, I was I was given an old oscilloscope. Oh, what's it worth? I said, I don't know. I, I was given it. It, you know, it, was, it, was, it was given to me. As far as I know, it's broken. It was just given to me. And Mr. Dick there proceeded to look up the model and find prices on eBay and then make me pay tax on the prices that he found of them listed on eBay because the fellow that sent it to me did not fill out a form that said no commercial value um, this is salvage had he checked that box then I would have got it for nothing but I had to pay a bunch of taxes on it so it didn't exactly cost me nothing but uh, cost me a lot less than it would have I guess if I had bought uh, a used scope anyway that's beside the point we're going to use the Tektronix 2465 as our scope to look at the waveform. Now, the first thing I need to do is I need to determine where the waveform is going to be tested from. On Sony's, all Sony machines have a header right there on this one, but they all have a header that you can clip on for checking your alignment. That's the beauty of Sony, is that they all have it. So let's connect this one up and uh, take a look at the waveform. And I haven't done anything to this. This is, uh, nothing's been touched. I haven't messed with this. This is how this machine is from when I grabbed it. For starters, you need a tape 
that you know is accurate that has been made on a machine that is good because obviously if you make a recording on a machine that the alignment is out then you will be correcting the alignment to a, a misaligned tape now one way to do that is to buy a commercial tape uh, good luck finding those these days but they used to be very expensive commercial alignment tape used to run well north of $100 most of them were around $150 and we're talking 40 years ago today finding a, a brand new commercial tape would be a, a challenge I think there may be a few kicking around out there but they're few and far between however you can use any commercial tape so if you've got a commercial movie which I, I know I've got some kicking around here now I won't be using them for this but you can use a tape so for example I could use my Titanic or Jurassic Park tape you know that these are going to be probably pretty damn close to being perfect if not perfect because they were most of these were duplicated using what's called a sprinter which is a contact printer uh, what that what they did was they created a master metal tape that was a mirror image of the signal that needed to be on a tape and then they basically brought this metal tape which had the recording on it they brought it in close proximity contact with blank media of standard normal ferric oxide or cobalt which is what VHS tapes were made from the metal tape having a stronger field would then penetrate into the oxide layers and the image would be retained that was called contact printing it was used for cassette tapes it was used for videotapes it allowed them to duplicate a, a two-hour movie in about I don't know, I think it was about 10 minutes it was fast the tape was literally running and fast forward the alignment on them will be as good as the alignment of the master tape which was generally very good the other way to do it of course as I said is with a commercial tape or if you've got a machine that you know is correct that's been verified with a commercial tape you can use that machine to make recordings which is what I did for my color bar tape so first things first we need to find which test points is RF and which test point is the switch pulse because we need both so let's take a look so I get my scope hope I'm not putting my head in the way I probably am I'll just sit down here so that I'm not in the way of the other camera um, we look at the scope if I connect my Sony probe here we'll see that this one here has the switched 30 which is the switch signal that's required to synchronize the scope and the other one here this next pin here is my RF so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up my second I don't my probe doesn't have a, a clip on it so I just have to use an alligator clip and we'll clip the alligator clip onto the the switched signal and I'll set my scope up for where are we here channel 2 so now I'm triggering my scope from channel 2 and my scope is displaying channel 1 so now I can see the waveform if I expand it a bit <clears throat> I can see that on the leading edge there the RF is a little bit lower but we want this waveform to be flat so this is not perfect this machine it's far from perfect well it's close but it's not perfect so to do the alignment I've got my alignment tool I just happen to have this you can use a flat blade, blade screwdriver or whatever else will fit and then we're just going to uh, tweak the guides and watch the waveform on the scope so the guide on the left side of the drum that's the entry for the waveform that's the left side the guide on the right side is the is the are the, the guide on the right of the drum is the exit so as I adjust this you'll see that the waveform will change and I want to try to make this as flat as possible so I'll increase the the scope scanning or timing so that I can get an expanded view and then I, oops and then I can go over and look at the where am I here uh, position Look at the other side over here and adjust the other guide as you can see now I'm affecting the waveform this is the secondary 
or the exit guide, I should say. We want to get this as flat as possible. And if I go back to showing the full waveform, you can now see what I'm doing here, right? We want to get that waveform flat. And that is probably about as perfect as this machine's going to be. Looking good. Right, the picture on the screen is good. Nice and clear. Every so often you hear the sound drop momentarily because there are some dropouts on the tape. After all, this tape was recorded in 2016. So this tape is eight years ago I recorded this tape because it's 2024 now. Recorded July 4th, 2016. So we're coming up on eight years. This tape's been used many times. It's been damaged. It's been crunched. It has had everything done to it, but uh, it still is functional as a color bar test tape. I can now verify the recording. I can put in one of my pre-recorded tapes and we'll take a look at how it looks. So let's do that. I will show you that on both cameras as well. We'll just stop them both at the same time here so that everything is synchronized. This time I'm going to use Titanic. And we'll see how this pre-recorded tape looks. Again, it should look good. Press play. And as you can see, the waveform there looks good. No problem with that waveform. Go to fast forward. So I could, in a pinch, I could use this as an alignment tape. If I tweak the entry side guide ever so slightly, you'll see. I don't think I can make it any better than that. Yeah, see, it is perfect. much perfect right there and now this is now aligned to this pre-recorded tape and the picture looks great so you can use a pre-recorded tape and they should all be I'm not saying that every pre-recorded tape is going to be a hundred percent but they're going to be very very close to being a hundred percent just because the duplicators generally tended to maintain their machines that they used to make the master tape that was then duplicated by high-speed duplication onto these pre-recorded tapes. They um, did do a, a, a pretty good job of maintaining the machines because the last thing they want to do is duplicate thousands of tapes only to have people complaining that they won't track and have to redo them. So they did uh, maintain pretty good quality control. So that's this Sony. We're going to grab another VCR. I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw this together. We're going to grab, I think I'll grab, I'm going to Panasonic. I don't know what's next. What's next here? What do we got? Uh, this is another Sony. I got a Sony and I got some Panasonics and some other stuff here. And I got some beta machines, but we'll grab another machine and we'll take a look at where to connect that one. I want to try to grab a few different machines just so we can see where the test points are on the various machines. This time I have a Panasonic. Let's pretend that I don't know which test point is which because I don't. I don't remember them all. Are you kidding me? Only the Sonys, and even that I get the pins mixed up because they didn't make them the same. That one that we just saw, for example, was pin two and three, or pin two and three were the test points, but sometimes it's pin three and pin five and so forth. It depends, right? So this one's a Panasonic. As far as I know, this machine works. It better work. Um, yeah, it works, okay. Let's figure out which test point is which. So I've got the scope going. I mean, I got the other camera running on the scope, and uh, we'll take a look with the the probe and see which one's which. So let's test test point three thousand and one, and that looks like video. That's video, so that's not the test point. Let's go to test point three thousand and two. Oh, that looks like that might be RF. What about test point uh, forty two oh seven? 
that looks like that could be one of them is hi-fi audio and the other one is, is RF for the video where is my my switching point somewhere in here there will be the switching point I gotta figure out which one that is and it could be one of these ones over here on the other side so let's just go over to this side and look for the switch point is it that but that one let's see here is that switch point uh, looks like that is a uh, well it's something wait a minute let's just uh, yep that's switch point right there or good enough good enough for switch point that's TP6205 so that's what we're gonna trace hook the scope to the, the trigger for the scope because that's what we need to see so I'm gonna go put my my probe back over here and again I can use either the the RF out for the heads or the RF out for hi-fi audio hi-fi audio is sometimes a little more accurate just because it's a it's a narrower track if you've got a hi-fi tape we'll clip on there and I will clip my other one on over to somewhere over here TP6205 okay scope is triggered off of uh, channel where are we on here channel 2 channel 2 oh, there we go all right and we know that's the hi-fi sound because we can actually see it we can see the the fluctuations there from the tone um same thing same thing the uh, alignment is a little bit off on this one not far but it's a little bit and it looks like it's the entry side which is the left side over here again i could use a slot screwdriver but hell i got the right tool so we'll just put that on there and you see what's happening right we make that flat and the same was on the other side we make it flat if I go to the from the um, audio to the this is the video output the, the video RF because we've got two separate heads right we've got a pair of heads that's tracing the audio and we got a pair of heads that's tracing the video track there's two there's two tracks recorded on the tape at different angles that's how VHS Hi-Fi worked. VHS Hi-Fi worked by recording the audio at a deep level and then recording video over top of it. And you see the audio Hi-Fi track is usually the one that you want to try to get, but I can show you this one here. You see, same thing happens. And the, the reason we want to use the audio Hi-Fi track, if we can, is just because the audio Hi-Fi track is a much narrower track and uh, it's, 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 it'll show up errors in tracking a lot sooner. It's a little more critical. And that is why when you had auto tracking on your VCR, they always track the hi-fi track first. Because, and if I illustrate this, maybe I will. I got some paper here. Let's go and uh, take a look at how hi-fi audio is recorded on VHS tapes. So let's just uh, do a little, little bit of uh, background on hi how hi-fi audio is recorded on VHS which is completely different than how it was recorded on beta and maybe just maybe I will tell you a story about today's six hour adventure I had looking to buy a used car for my son yeah it's always an adventure um, we'll draw this not to scale so this is the tape and your video tracks well first of all we'll draw the head drum so this is the head drum and it's got your video heads here this is the if this is the slot you got the video heads and you've got an audio head ahead of it on the head drum and I'll, I'll show you this on the actual drum in a minute but how it works is that the audio head is ahead of the video uh, video head so it's the, the the direction of the drum is turning is counterclockwise so the drum is spinning this direction okay so the audio head and that's the video head the audio head lays down a track first the audio head lays down a deep recorded track so we'll draw the track in like this but it's a skinny little track but we'll draw the track in like that and then we'll draw the the we'll draw the angle of the the actual azimuth because it's quite steep it's like plus and minus I think it's 30 degrees so there's a 60 degree difference between the two tracks and then the next track would be right next to it and it's recorded at a different angle because one's at plus 30 and the other's at minus 30 degrees
that's the audio track. And then when the video head comes along, if you're recording an EP, the video head would be about the same width, the video track would be about the same width, but if you're recording an SP, actually, if you're recording an EP, the video track would come down right over top of this, pretty much, pretty much exactly the same tape width, it's like 22, 22 or a little bit less microns for the audio head. Uh, if you were recording an SP, your tracks would actually be spread out. So your your one track would be here for audio. And then there'd be a big gap. And then the next track would be there for audio. Because the, the audio heads use skinny little tracks. I know, not drawn to scale, but you get the idea. Audio would be like this. And then the other angle this way. My pen looks like it's running out of ink. Anyway, video track comes along. So for EP, the video track records directly over top of it, and but it records, again, a plus and minus six degree. So instead of the tracks being like this, they're actually opposite. They're more like this one, but not to the same, not to the same degree. It's more, more almost more perpendicular over top. And the same with this one here, almost, almost straight up and down. On the SP speed, your video track comes along and your video track is now going to record like right over top of this. And then the other one would be, would be there. And it's going to record its video like this. And the other one would be One's plus seven and the other's minus seven degrees, but you get the idea. On playback, because of the steep angle difference between the audio and the video, the audio signal can be picked up by the audio head. There's going to be interference from the video signal, and that's what was causing that roughness on the edge of the, of the waveform. You're seeing the actual pulses from the video track bleeding into the audio, but because the angle is steep enough it um, can filter it out but when you look at the RF on the scope you see it that's uh, in a nutshell how VHS lays down I didn't draw this all the way through this track is much wider there's but there's guard bands on SP between the audio head because they're little skinny heads for your on your video head itself, if we were to draw that in, if we were to draw an enlargement of the video head, if this is the, the, the head drum, you've got a little skinny video head, or a little skinny audio head there, and then you've got a little skinny audio head for uh, EP, and then you've got a much bigger, or sorry, video head, you've got a much bigger video head for SP, and the two heads will be side by side, but the audio track is very, very thin, and it's, again, it's at a different angle. Uh, it would be more of an angle like that for one and, and the opposite for the other because of the deep layer and the angle that it records at. Plus, the uh, video head A, A was minus 6 degrees and the um, audio was plus 30 and the B head would be like plus seven degree, or plus 6 degrees for video and minus 30 degrees for audio. So there's a 36 degree, uh, 36 degree differential between the audio and the video head on the same given track. Otherwise, they would cause too much interference with each other and you wouldn't be able to make it work. And beta was uh, plus and minus 7 degrees, but because beta on the NTSC system did not require additional heads. And I know the, the beta hi-fi on the PAL system, because of the slower head drum speed, it's spinning slower due to the 25 frames versus 30 frames, or 50 hertz, 50, 50, 50 cycles, or 50 frame, 50 fields versus 60 fields, the head drum is running slower. So the relative speed was not enough to place the carrier in. With beta, looking at the spectrum, okay, your your color was down here at 688 kilohertz, and then there was room for four little audio carriers, for two for the left and two for the right, because you have two heads, right? You got left and right for head A and left and right for, for head B. So you have a left, right, left, right for the A field and for the B field. And then the video, it went and took up the rest of the spectrum. It got away with it on beta and 8mm high 8 because there was enough bandwidth between the chroma and the 
luminance. But because on PAL, the head drum speed was slower, so your video had to be recorded at a lower frequency, so the video actually came right down closer to where the 688 kilohertz color was. This would be video or luminance. And this is the chroma. VHS, because again VHS has a smaller head drum, so the rotation speed, even though it's the same, there's a slower head to the tape relative speed. VHS, if this is the spectrum, VHS has the chroma at 629 kilohertz. And then the, the luminance right there. And 8 millimeter, if we want to go down that road, if we have 8 millimeter, 8 millimeter, same thing. Chroma is at 733. And then you have the carriers for the two carriers if it's a mono machine, four carriers if it's a stereo machine, and then, of course, the luminance. So 8 millimeter worked just like beta for the uh, where they put the sound. And all 8 millimeter used AFM audio. There was no linear sound on 8 millimeter. Anyway, that's that. I know you guys are dying to hear my story about my car shopping, so I'll tell you that right now. Um, so, when my son turned 16 in 2016, they call 16-year-olds, yeah, I get a car. He wasn't so interested in getting a car. And I said to him, I said, hey, I'll tell you what. You get your driver's license. You can have my Thorns TD-165 turntable because he was getting into vinyl. And he's all excited. He goes and gets his learner's permit. And um, I give him the turntable. But he doesn't learn to drive. He had a perfect opportunity. His grandfather gave him his car when he lost his license due to old age. Um, but he never learned to drive it. In fact, he bumped another car and that scared him and he wasn't going to drive. I tried for two years while he had his learner's permit to get him to learn how to drive and he, he would not do it. He had the thick skull that he did not need to drive a car and he was going to take the bus everywhere for the rest of his life, or so he thought. And it was too easy just to pick up his phone and press a button on his phone and have a hamburger delivered for $25 15 minutes later. That was too convenient. S skipping the dishes and DoorDash or whatever those apps are. I've never used one, so I, I can't talk about how expensive, other than the fact that how much he told me it cost. And he was telling me to, to, get, to get a Big Mac and uh, some chicken nuggets delivered. It was like 30 bucks. It was ridiculous because, of course, they charge more. But then the driver always wants a tip. So every time he's, he's having to tip the di driver five bucks, because if he doesn't tip the driver five bucks, next time he orders it, the driver says, to hell with you, I'm not picking it up, and it just sits there getting cold. So, uh, yeah, lots, lots, of expensive, lots of expensive hamburgers and lots of very expensive pizzas. If I want a pizza, I go up and get, get it myself, and I can get a pizza for ten bucks, but he's paying twenty-five bucks to have the same thing delivered. Um... Anyway, he lets his, lets his license expire, doesn't bother to learn to drive, and brings me down his, uh, or brings me down my TD-165 and says, here, you can, you can have your turntable back. I'm not going to drive. Fast forward to this year, and he decides that he wants to drive. And I said, well, if you get your license, I'll get you a car. So that's, that, was, that was today's adventure, 300, just under 300 kilometers round trip to go there and back. I had to drive all the way out to Kent. Anybody who knows the, the Vancouver region realizes that Kent is actually, uh, uh, it's beyond Chilliwack. It's between Chilliwack and Hope. It's a long haul. It's over by, it's over by uh, um, Harrison Hot Springs and stuff, if you know the area. Uh, anyway, I drive all the way up there to this car. I think we found a great car. Low mileage. Uh, listed at 124,000 kilometers. But it's an older car. It was like, I think it was a 95. And, uh, but, you know, okay, it's only 124,000 kilometers, 124,500 kilometers. Oh, that's, that's looking good. That's like it's almost broke, just broken in, if it's true, right? So I go out there and I look at it, and, um, well, I, yeah, there's a few things that were not present in the ad. If Had these been present in the ad, I probably wouldn't have wasted my time. But I get there, and, you know, it, it, I notice that the, the headlights were, um, well, it's these plastic headlights, and I, I, I think I got a picture of it here on my phone because I took some pictures of the car and uh, anyway uh, here is the headlights so <clears throat> as you can see the headlights are starting to get cloudy because they're plastic so that needs to be addressed there's a little little oopsie there a little dent on the hood he says someone backed into him 
and uh, I mean, other than that, the car doesn't look to be in too bad a shape. I'm blocking the license plate on here just for the seller's privacy. But it's the right color. My son wanted a green car, so I found him a green car, and it doesn't look to be in too bad a shape. And then I took it out for a drive. Yeah, it's, you know, a couple little scuffs on it. A couple little scuffs here and there. Right? A little bit, you know, but again, a 30-year-old car, that's to uh, be expected. So I, I get in the car and well, let's take it out for a drive. So start it up. Check the oil. Oil's clean, okay, but you could have just cleaned it. Could have changed the oil, I don't know. Start it up. First thing I notice is that the ABS light is on. Well, that's strike number one. And the traction control light is on. That's strike number two. Okay, well, we'll, we'll take it out for a drive. So I, I take it for a drive. It seems to accelerate okay and handles okay and I don't feel anything loose. Everything's sounding okay. I don't hear any strange sounds coming from under the hood. I did notice that the speedometer was bobbing, though. It was doing the, like, you know, you know normally the gauge on a speedometer should be pretty state, steady. But this one's doing this. So I noticed that the speedometer is kind of bobbing around a bit. So I got alarm bells going off in my head here thinking, hmm, did someone undo the speedo cable from the transmission and hook up a drill to it and spin it backwards and run down the miles? Or did they take the speedo apart and roll it back? Hmm, you got to think, right? You got to think about people selling cars. Did that happen? Well, I don't know. But uh, take a little test drive, come back, right? And uh, then I... Uh, I noticed putting it into park that, well, it's, the gear shift is kind of a bit stiff going into park. I had to put extra effort on it getting it into park. So that's the next alarm bell. Okay, why is this sticking? Has this thing been crunched? Is there an alignment problem between the linkage? But it was stiff going into park. So that's the next alarm bell going off. I turned on the heater and it's like, oh, the fan's not working. It's not blowing any air on either hot or cold. Like the fan is completely out. Okay, and the guy's like, oh, it might be just a fuse. Okay, yeah, it might be a fuse, but maybe the fuse has been pulled because there's another problem, or maybe something is shorted and blew the fuse. So that's the next alarm bell that goes off. Then I get out. I say, can you pop the trunk? He goes, yeah, I don't have the key to the trunk. I said, pardon? Ford used to have a separate key for the trunk. He says, I got to pop it from the inside. So he goes inside the car and he pops the trunk so I can open the trunk up. And of course the trunk's clear. The trunk is clean. Except for the spring that holds the trunk open is no good. So the trunk won't stay open. You have to hold it open or use a stick. So I was like, oh my god, this thing's got lots wrong with it. I don't think this is going to be a car to buy. It's uh, So now he, he, my wife was the one that contacted him. He contacts her and he says, yeah, I'm willing to negotiate the price. <laughs> I bet he is. I said, like, you you better really negotiate the price if you think I'm going to buy that piece of crap from you. You know, I mean, it might it might, might run fine, but I'm just kind of a little bit gun shy when I start seeing all these little quirks on this car. And I mean, I mean, people think, well, you know, I, I'm an electronics guy. What do I know about cars? Uh, I'll tell you one thing I know about cars. Before I was in electronics, when I was younger, I used to tinker a lot with cars. And I can tell you I blew a few cars up. I blew up cars that uh, one should never be able to blow up. I um, I managed to blow up a 1966 Plymouth Valiant engine, 225 slant 6. Anybody who knows cars knows that that's the indestructible engine that will run forever. You could Some people say you could run it without oil. I can assure you, you cannot run it without oil. I can certainly assure you that. Um, <laughs> Rodney uh, put an extra inspection port into the block to prove that fact. And no, no, I did not run it out of oil. Okay. What had happened was me and my goofy friends, when we were young, uh, used to go flying around the old farm roads. And uh, there was a set of railway tracks that were a little bit higher than the road. And you could almost get air over them. And uh, we used to fly over these tracks. And well, one day I flew over the tracks. And well, I didn't know what was on the other side until I hit it. It was a, a pitchfork that was lying in the middle of the road with the prongs facing up. And I didn't even know what the hell it was. I just saw what looked like a piece of, looked like a stick. Uh, what happened was the pitchfork went right through the oil pan and into the engine and got all ground up inside there. And well, it didn't take long for the engine to start making some pretty, pretty bad sounds, let's just say. And uh, uh, I didn't get home. Let's put it that way. I, I did not make it home. 
But when I did get home, we found out that uh, we could see daylight through the engine. And there was piston nuggets all over the place. I managed to blow up a 225 slant 6. That's not the only thing I managed to break. I had a 62 Valiant as well that I managed to break the rear axle. Now, this is a 225 slant 6. It's not a real powerful engine. I managed to break the rear axle on it. And then I managed to blow up my dad's 240 turbo diesel. That one wasn't my fault, though. It wasn't my fault that a seal blew in the turbo and it started burning uh, engine oil until the uh, engine basically ran away. And by the time we got it to stop, well, the engine was pretty much history. It had to be rebuilt. To top it all off, though, and here's another one that should not have never have happened. Borg Warner T5, or, uh, was it T5? Yeah, I think it was Borg Warner T5, manual transmission, 86 uh, Mustang with a 5-liter engine, I somehow managed doing stupid things like racing. We used to go to the old airport when it wasn't an airport and race, uh, drag race on the old closed runways. It's now a working airport, but back in 1979 it wasn't. Or I think the airport opened in the mid-80s, mid but back then we used to go down, we used to drag race, and somehow I managed to break a transmission, a manual transmission. I managed to break it. So, and of course, every time I broke these things, I had to fix them myself. So I do know a few things about cars and what sounds they shouldn't make. And this one wasn't making any unusual sounds, but when you see all the check engine, not check engine, but the, the ABS light comes on, that could be a ABS pump for that matter. It could be a sensor, it could be the pump, and also the, uh, the, the uh, traction control light again. It's all, to, all linked to the ABS system. So I think, you know, this, this car is literally, if it's a $500 car, it might be worth investigating, but not for what the guy is asking. Not at this point, anyway. But that's my little story. Uh, I wasted half the day. I left at like 9 o'clock in the morning, or 9.30 in the morning. I didn't get back till like 3 in the afternoon, and now I'm playing around with VCRs. Anyway, I figured you guys might like that story. Let's get another VCR up and uh, take a look at the test points on it. This time I'm on a Toshiba. Get the second camera running here on the scope. All right, this is the Toshiba. This one's a, what is this one? This is a W522CF. And this one here is actually labeled. It tells us where our test points are, which is nice. I wish they all did this. But if you look down here on the board, there are test points. And it tells us, it says, look at this. Video out, audio out. Give me something to point with. Video out, audio out. Envelope. Switching pulse, control track, get down. Okay, so let's uh, let's get down the scope on the get down signal. I could actually use the tuner for that matter. It's the same thing. I'll just clip it on the tuner. We will clip the envelope on here. And I mean, I can show you guys the scope. Let me just show the scope. Uh, play it back. You're looking at the scope. If I tap it onto the HD, the head switch, that's HD switch, doesn't, that doesn't stand for high definition switch, it says head switching, because that's what we want, it. we want it, We want the scope to trigger on that, and we want to look at the, the envelope, so, oh, head clogged there momentarily, so we'll clip this one onto the envelope, and we will clip the other one here onto the head switch, I know I need another probe, but I'm just too cheap to buy one. They're like 60 bucks. So I got and bought a second one. All right, now, here we go. Look at the, the waveform coming off of the heads. One head's a little lower than the other, as you can see. If you look at that, I'm looking at the other camera to see what I'm doing. Other camera's over my shoulder. Hey, maybe I'll do some two camera stuff. Wouldn't you guys like, would you guys like to see two camera sh shoots? Because I certainly, I can certainly do it. I got you know, put the second camera over my shoulder. Um, well, I'm a little more work for editing, but um, I can certainly do that on some videos. But I figured on this one because I'm dealing with a scope rather than usually what I do is I do one shot and then I realign the camera and and do the shot of the scope and basically do the same thing over, reenact it for the camera for the cutaway rather than do it with the two cameras. But I can certainly do it with two cameras. That's not a not an issue. Make sure that I'm not in the shot, because of course, when I reach up to do anything, I'm going to be in the other camera uh, uh, field of view. 
So again, this one here, you can see one head is a little lower than the other, and that's just probably due to headwear. But the alignment on this one is not bad. But you can see, I can tweak it there. I'm looking at, I'm doing the exit guide, you can see. Get that flat, and then we'll go to the, the other side over here. And we'll adjust that one to try to make that one as flat as possible as well. And you know, that's the alignment is correct. And of course, sometimes you know, they're they're really bad. Like if it's like that, you're going to see it in the picture, right? If you're like that, you're probably not going to really notice much in the picture. It's close enough, but ideally, you want to try to make it as flat as possible. That's the Toshiba. Mm -hmm. But what I'm getting at is, you just have to look at different test points and you, you can figure them out with the scope you, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure it out even when they're not labeled I mean this one makes it just so easy because it's labeled but even when it's not labeled you can see it and if I look at the audio out there's the audio right there's the waveform from the audio that'd be the linear audio I'm pretty sure and then of course video out that's the video signal at, at 60 Hertz and if I crank it up we can uh, look at the uh, I have to actually delay it here if I want to look at a single line. There's the color burst. You see the color burst? I can actually set the scope so that I can look at individual lines, but I'm not going to bother. Not for this. This is uh, looking at the, the video waveform. There's, there's video. We're just looking at the, a, a full field. Anyway, that's... Um, that's that one. What else do I have here that I can drag out? This is actually not a bad machine. Let me see what else I can drag out and uh, we can set up on the bench. I don't want this to get going. I don't want this video to be like hours long. I don't want to be a Mr. Carlson two hour marathon. Sorry, I had it. I had it. I had to say that because I've read <laughs> not on my channel, okay? But I get um, on Facebook. Somebody made some comment, and, and I don't know who it was, but somebody made some comment, and somehow uh, Paul's channel came up, and some of the some of the comments were quite, let's just say, quite funny about how long his videos are. He says he takes he takes an hour to explain something that could have been explained in five minutes. And I, I have to say, and I'm not taking any shots at Paul because I've known Paul for years. He's a ham operator. I've known him for many, many years. He's a smart guy, but uh, he, he likes the old tube stuff, okay? He loves his old tube equipment. But um, sometimes... It, it, I, well, I can't watch his channel. I, I can't, I'll fall asleep because I know what he's... Like I know the stuff that he's talking about, because I'm I've done the same work. I've done the work for over forty years, so I know the stuff that he talks about. And I just find that to, to someone who knows the stuff, it's a good way to go to sleep. It's uh, you know because it's just so drawn out and boring. And and I'm not taking shots at Paul because I think he's a great guy. I just think that sometimes it's 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 okay to do it once, but to for every single video, if he's going to spend an hour to, to, to tell you how to test a capacitor for the outside foil, then, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, you catch my breath. Okay, anyway, no, but no shots at Paul, because I think Paul's a great guy, and he's a very smart guy, and he loves his vintage stuff. And, um, you know, as he told me once, when I, was, I ran into him a few years ago at a ham fest, and uh, he said, yeah, he says, people think my, like, people can say my bench is messy. His is a set. You should know that, that what he shoots on is a set. He said to me, he says, don't look behind the camera. <laughs> he says, I don't show you what goes on behind the camera. He says, everything that he puts on his bench, that's built for a set. It's built for show. Mine isn't. Mine's a working bench, but when he's working, the stuff that's not on camera, his bench is not as pristine as it looks on camera. I'll just say that. And that was right out of his own mouth. I haven't been in his shop but uh, that's what he told me when I ran, I ran into him a few years ago at a ham fest. And I think I did a video on the ham fest and everybody saw him there. But uh, yeah, he says, yeah, it was uh, just don't look behind. You know, that's what you see on camera is not what the rest of his shop looks like. The rest of his shop looks like every other shop, which basically looks like mine. When you're working, you don't keep everything pristine. 
but for on camera, so he has a little separate area that he records in. And it's spotless. Let's get another one. This time I got a Sony Betamax. Little, uh, I got an alignment tape for this too, a proper alignment tape. But we'll, we'll first look, do a rough calibration using the tape that was recorded on my machine, which is probably pretty close. I haven't checked it in years, so we'll take a look at it first of all with this one. So loading the tape, as you can see, the beta threads a little different. This is the 711 chassis, the 710 chassis threads the other way. In fact, on my opening logo, when you see the beta that threads this way, that's actually a beta cam machine that I showed. But the consumer beta using the 710 chassis and the earlier chassis, SL5000 series, SL8600, all the 5000 series, 8600, 7200, they all wrap the tape this way, like the beta cam machine. When they went to the 711 uh, chassis, they went to this type of a wrap with these pins that drop down. Don't know quite why they did it. Well, I, I think I do know why they did it, because it was cheaper. It was a more compact mechanism. They designed this one for the porta pack the SL2000 of the day. That was the first one. And the 2500 and 2700. They went to these re retractable pins because it made the mechanism smaller. The other one required quite a bit of real estate to pull the tape out. But this was not as good a mechanism, not by a long shot, to the older one that had the three-piece drum, which they also followed through with for the Betacam SP. Anyway, let's uh, find our test points. They are going to be here on this one. So we'll start the tape playing. And we will find which test point is for RF and which one is for the head switching. So if you look at the scope up in the corner of the screen, we'll ground and we'll look for the RF, which should be pin number three. No, nope. is it not? Am I missing something on this one, or is that the? Uh, might be the. T that might be the. Uh, what do we got here? That's our switch point. Pin three is our switch point, and pin five is the uh, PG. And which one is the RF? Is it pin four or is it pin two? I forget. Jeez, it's been so long since I worked on these. It's one of these ones. Uh, pin one maybe. It's pin one. Oops. What happened there? It just stopped. Oh, did I hit the stop button? Or did I just break something? Uh, play. Okay, that's our RF. Oh, look at that. Well, that one's not very good. We already know which one the, uh, the head switching is. It's the third one. So let me just get this scope on here and we'll clip the RF onto its appropriate test point. There we go. Okay. Ow. Oh, that doesn't look very good, does it? How's the tracking control? Tracking control is dead center. Again, I don't know whether the machine that recorded this is 100% or not. It might not be. But one thing for sure, that waveform looks like it could use a little bit of adjustment. On the beta machines, these are our adjustment points. One is right here, and the other one is over there. Because I want to make sure that my alignment is to factory specs, I am going to use the actual Sony alignment tape, which is this one right here. So we'll just eject this one first. And put in the alignment tape and then I have to fast forward this out to where the um, alignment portion begins which is like I think it's 12 minutes in on the tape so it'll take us a few, few minutes to get there good thing I've got beta scan color bars see color bars let's see how color bars look how do they look on here well, the color bars don't look too bad on beta there's actually a, a special alignment section which only has RF on one of the heads. So the, the machine I recorded the other tape on probably should be checked. This is this one's the monoscope I'm looking at now. Again, looking good. All right, this machine looks, to, um, uh, actually it looks to be pretty much perfect. 
but we'll go to the actual section of the tape. This is the RF sweep now. We'll get to the section where we're doing alignment. I think this is it here. Uh, yeah, that's the RF. So what Sony did on theirs is they only recorded the RF on one head. The other one just does this blip, 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 blip. And that way we could take a look at the, the one head that we're going to do the alignment with and see that it actually is off a little bit on here. So we set our tracking control to center, which is like right there. And we're going to tweak the guides. The entry guide here will affect the waveform on this side as I move it. You see? So turn that up and bring this over this where we here. You can see the oh, uh, the waveform changing there, you see? So we want that to be flat. And then we go to the other side over here. And this one here, we do the same. And I'm going to use a screwdriver on this just because I don't want to damage this. This one here's set for a screwdriver. There you go, you see? Perfect. Pretty much perfect. We'll go back to the, the entrance side again. And just bring that so that it's perfectly level. There, I think we got it. By George, I think we got it. Rewind the tape back. And I'll throw the other tape back in and just verify that everything looks good. Oh, it's got a tape counter. I could have gone by that because it has, it actually has the counter marks on here. It's four minutes each, but it says like, like it says between 75 and 100 on the tape counter is where the RF sweep is. Between 100 and 124, had I zero this at zero, it would have been uh, fairly close, or should have been fairly close. The old mechanical, the old mechanical tape counter, right? right? That's because this tape came out before they had tape counters that, that did the uh, counting the tracking or count, ta counting the control track pulses. They did not have real-time counters, the original beta machines. So they, they carried that on through. Let's just take a look at how this one looks now. I will just see how far out my... Uh, I recorded this on my SLHF-1000, I'm pretty sure. And... Uh, or I might have been recorded on my 900. I forget what this was recorded on. It was recorded on one of, my, one of my machines. But it might have been one. might have been the 1000 that I that I swapped the head on, and I swapped a head drum. I put a head drum from a 900 on a 1000 because I had one that seized up, and that might have been the machine that I recorded this on. I forget. It's so long ago that this was recorded. But playback wise, it looks fine. But you can see that there's a, just a little, a little drop off of right there. So maybe I'll bring that machine in and we'll do an alignment on it. Should I do it now? Let's go grab the SLHF 1000. We'll put the alignment tape on that and check that out and make sure that it's perfect. I'm I'm pretty sure it is because I think I probably did an alignment on it after I made this recording. Because I would never use I would never use this to align someone's machine because I have a proper alignment tape. So when I'm doing an alignment on a beta machine, I always use the factory tape for that. So that might have been why that this one, that machine I'm sure is probably aligned now. But when I recorded this tape, I think I recorded this right after I did the head drum swap and put the drum from a 900 into the 1000 because my 1000 head drum had seized up. And I think I recorded this tape prior to uh, doing the alignment on it. Anyway, it looks fine. As we continue this video on uh, doing your alignment, I figured I would show you this machine here. This is quite a unique machine. This is an 8mm VCR, but it's different than most of the 8mm VCRs that you've seen, and I will drag out a different chassis in a minute. But we're going to look at this one first. Again, the alignment is done using the same test points that we had on all the Sonys. All the Sonys have a header on them, which makes them relatively easy to set up because you're not looking for different test points. They actually have it right there for you. What makes this one different? Can you spot it already? 
and we're going to look at the other one in a minute. But essentially there's two types of loading mechanisms that are available for video equipment. The original video loading was called the U loading system, sometimes called the Omega Wrap. And it was originally used by Betamax. Well, actually, it was originally used by three quarter inch. You see a, a three quarter inch machine on my opening uh, logo. And you see it on Beta. And you also see it on, well, eight millimeter. Uh, maybe you haven't seen it on eight millimeter, but this is the original eight millimeter loading system. Look familiar? I think it does. It looks exactly like the beta. In fact, this shot that I just did here is likely going to make it into my opening logo of different machines threading because I just think this is cool, the way that these ones operate. It's a, a much simpler, much more reliable system than the M loading system, but it takes up more real estate. And that's one of the reasons it was abandoned was because it does take up more room. But basically, it's a, a very good system. On this one, the alignment points are entry guide and the exit guide is over there. So we're gonna scope this one as well. So let me get the other camera running. Where's our test points on this? Well, we know, we know where our test points are, but which one, we're gonna identify which one's which. We'll use the scope to uh, tell us that one. And I, I don't think the alignment is an issue on this one. It shouldn't be. Although I did change the head drum, but it still shouldn't be a problem. And a crease went by on the tape. I guess you guys saw that. <laughs> and the crease went by again on the tape. Oh, I think the tape stuck. What do you think? Oops. We'll have to fix that. <laughs> that is funny, actually. I'm not laughing. But that... Uh, obviously, there was something on the tape that stuck. And it stuck good. Wow. You witnessed it. You witnessed it live. That I just happened to be recording that when uh, the tape decided it was going to do a little wrap job of its own. <laughs> oh man, look at this. I had that happen to me when I was on the air, believe it or not. When I was in broadcast, when I was on the air, a machine did that on the air. And wrapped the whole whack of tape on a three quarter inch machine, just like this. How much tape got wrapped around this goddamn drum? Holy crap! Look at it all! Unbelievable! Like, we got like... Well, when the, when the machine did it on air for me, I had like 20 feet of tape wrapped around the inside of a machine. And it did it when I was rewinding a tape. I was, we were just in the transition process to go from, from a, a three quarter inch down to one inch, or from one inch to three quarter inch. And I had all my programming for the evening was on uh, was on three quarter inch, except for one tape was on uh, one inch. And I was right in the process. I was rewinding the tape. Well, it's still wrapped around here. What the? What the hell? Okay. Now it'll come out. How much tape did we ruin? Oh my crap! Oh my god! Look at this! Unbelievable! I should stop the other camera while it's still rolling. I'm wasting tape. Um. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, well, I guess well, something was sticky on that tape and it stuck to the inside of the machine. That is uh, unbelievable. But look at this. I've got like, I don't know, there's probably 10 feet of tape that's that's out here. I mean, this is ridiculous. Well, let me uh, fix this and we'll pick this up in a minute. Why that tape got chewed up, I don't know. It could have been something on the tape that's the most likely thing. Something sticky was on the tape that caused it to stick to the head drum. Or it could have been when I ex exhaled and breathed on the drum because I am out in the workshop here. It's not exactly super warm out here. It's not cold though. It's 16 degrees, but 
It may have been when I was breathing, because I was in fairly close as I was looking for that test point. It could have been my breath on the head drum here caused some condensation, which caused the uh, tape to stick. That is also, let's see what happens if I breathe on the drum. Will it fog up? Yes, it will, you see? Probably what happened is when I was talking, you can see, if we look at the drum, you can see that uh, it got condensation on it. So if I just, if I'm just talking like this, you can see that the uh, drum itself gets condensation on it. See that? That's likely why when I was talking, I caused a bit of condensation, which caused the tape to stick. That's more than likely why it stuck. Um, eight millimeter being such a fragile format, same with mini DV, the tape itself is very, very thin. It does not take much to make things stick. So we're going to start this up again. I'm going to find my test points and um, do the alignment. I'll try not to breathe on the machine this time while I'm doing it because uh, I think that's more than likely what uh, caused the problem the last time was I just happened to breathe on it. So let's uh, start the machine up again. And try not to take off another 15 feet of tape. Has to wind a bit forward because I spliced it. I spliced it back to the leader. Okay, I'm gonna keep my I'm gonna keep my uh, humid breath away from this thing while I find you guys the the test point. Okay, here's the alignment off the eight millimeter machine. As you can see, it's actually it's perfect, and I would expect it to be perfect because. When I changed the head on this, when I bought this machine, I bought this machine for 20 bucks. When I bought this machine, the head was FUBAR. And I had to replace the head, and I used a head from a camera. So I put it in pause, for example, we lost half the picture, because this was this original one was a three head, so it had good pause and freeze frame and so forth. And I don't think it had slow-mo, but it had pause. It went to the third head, but this is a two head drum. So we don't get we don't get pause on this one. But back to regular play. That looks good. That's that, that I mean that's as good as a, you're never gonna get any better than that. That's perfect. But I'll go through the motions. I'll put the little adjustment tool on here just so that you can see what it does do if I tweak it because as I say it's already it's already good. I guess this one. You'll see what it does when I turn it. If I can turn it. Can I do it with this tool? This one just uses a screwdriver. That's what I need for this. Just a regular slotted screwdriver, for at least for this guy. See the difference I'm doing there? And then the other one is over here. This is the entrance side over here. There we go. Perfect. 
picture looks great. Every so often you see a little glitch because the tape's got dropouts in it. This transport was used on the original CCD V8 and it was also used on the V110. I think the V220 used it as well. And then they went to the M loading, which a big 8mm can use either. And for that matter, VHS could have used this a U loading as well. Right? Um, Beta could have used an M loading. It doesn't really matter. When you thread the tape, everyone thinks, oh, well, VHS used the M loading because the M loading was better. Well, it, it actually wasn't better. It was just it made for a more compact mechanism. And uh, this is actually simpler because the tape stays loaded. But it doesn't really matter across the formats. This is what I'm trying to point out. They, they can use either an M loading or a U loading. 8mm uh, used both. Uh, the M loading became the standard because it was more compact than the U loading. And um, even though this was simpler because everything was all on one on one mechanism, on one loading wheel, one big gear that uh, did all the loading, this was actually a simpler mechanism to operate. And reliability-wise, this would have been better, but uh, it also took up more space. And for camcorders, which is what the 8mm format was basically targeting, was camcorders. For camcorders, space is everything. You want the smallest amount of space. So speaking of that, I'm going to go and grab a M loading 8mm and we'll take a look at that, which is you know, more familiar, what you're familiar with, which is the uh, mechanism used on VHS. But I just wanted to show you this and I think I think that that tape eating being eaten there, that segment's going to have to go onto the uh, onto the opening. What do you guys think? That'll have that piece, that piece where that tape got eaten has to go in the loading, in, into the uh, opening logo at some point. That's classic. Anyway, let's eject this tape. And you can watch how this thing unspools. Just like that. I'm going to grab the M loading 8mm. We'll take a look at that, and I think that'll pretty, pretty much do it for this one. So this is the M loading mechanism from the EVC3 that I worked on the other day or a week or so ago. As you can see the mechanism is a little more compact. It doesn't need as much space as the U-loading mechanism needed to uh, thread up the tape. And this one plays fine. It's working in good shape. I'm sure the alignment is good on this. We'll identify the alignment test points. They're going to be back here, and it's going to be the same as um, it's going to be the same as the uh, all the rest of them. The Sony's It'll be probably pin three and five or one and three. Get the scope on here, and then get the other camera going and take a look at it. So once again. Identify which one is which. Try not to breathe on the drum while I'm at it. It's number three. Three and is it four and three and five? One of these will be the, the switch pulse. It's that one I believe is number two. Yeah, number two. So two and three are the ones I'm looking for. We'll just bend these down so that I can quickly. Connect to it. So that was that one. And this will be. Yeah, Sony had plugs to plug into these. Okay, well the alignment is a little bit off on this. Look at that. That's the exit side. So that's this guide right here.
These ones are loose. Look at that. Wow. Okay, we'll just make it perfect. The um, I guess the lock screw on this is not tight. This is a machine that I use for when I'm transferring tapes that are out of whack. So um, I have the guides intentionally loose so that I can just tweak them very, very quickly and not have to deal with uh, fiddle farting around, loosening and tightening up lock uh, posts. But there are there are little lock screws on here. I'll show you where they are. They are on the side here. I think they are on the side on these ones. Where the heck are they? They're right down here. You can see them. I can take this out of here now. Don't need that in there anymore. The alignment is correct on here. So let's get the scope out of the way. And there are little screws right down on the side. Down here, the little black screws. And that is what locks the guides in place. So you tighten those down and it stops them from turning. There's one on this side over here. A little black screw there. And a little black screw over here. And you just tighten those down. And that will prevent them from spinning on their own. That's one of the problems that happened on these machines is the um, alignment or the guides work their way loose. And once that happened, the um, guides could just walk on their own. It was really common on all these type of machines. That was one of the advantages of the the uh, U-loading is that, that they didn't have movable guides. The guides themselves were fixed, so they didn't have a tendency to work their way loose like the ones did with the M-loading system. Lucy! It's Lucy! That's better. And this one here again. Got to get that screwdriver in there and just kind of tighten this down a bit. There, that might be a bit better. Still a little bit on the loose side. Problem is getting in here. There's this other guide. That's, or this other roller that's in the way, so I can't really get in there that well with the screwdriver to try to get this thing tight. I think I may have got it a bit better that time. I just want to make sure that it doesn't just turn on its own. There we go. Now it doesn't move. Right. Now I got to put some effort into moving it. So that's a, that's a lot better. Okay, so that, I think that uh, will resolve this one. I'm trying to think if I've got any more machines to bore you guys with. I do have more machines. I do have other ones. I don't know whether I should even bother uh, going down that road and putting up a JVC. Maybe I will, just because I, I've shown you a Toshiba. I've shown you Panasonic. I've shown you a couple Sonys. Uh, I do have a JVC. We'll put that one up and try to finish it off because we're getting kind of long in the tooth here if you know what I'm I'm talking about. I'm getting into Carlson territory and we don't want to be into Carlson territory. That's not a good place to be. I was going to show you this machine but I think this machine's broken. So it's ticking like it's going to explode. Did it turn on? Uh, I think this one's foobar. So, this will be a repair video at some point. Because this machine does not want to turn on. It is dead. Right? Oh, it did turn on. Okay, why was it ticking? Okay, maybe it's going to work. Maybe it will work. We'll try it. Well, I thought it was going to work, but it looks like it shut off on me. Oh, wonderful. The button just pushed right through the front. Huh, maybe that's part of the problem. Um, okay. Uh, the, the power button just kind of snapped off on this piece of junk. Uh, does not want to turn what, what turn on the tape into it. Okay, the power button doesn't work. Wonderful, it turned on. Uh, and then it turned off. Wonderful! What the hell's wrong with it? Huh. 
I turn it back on, and that turned off. Will it play? Well, I'll put it in the play. Well, it's playing. It's got color bars with all kinds of interference from the plasma on it, which is to be expected. I don't even know where the test points are on this one. Uh, I can always grab it from the, the preamp up here. You can always just plug into one of these and get my get my um, my RF there. There should be RF back here somewhere. This uses modules. These ones use like vertical modules in here that have got all the circuitry on them, and, and they use those funky ICs that JVC was so famous for, which makes them a piece of junk. Yeah, my books. These ones are a piece of sheet. These ones are the ones that the guide posts actually detached at the bottom. That they were held in place by little little metal clips, and the clips would break free, and uh, the guides would fall right out on them. They were just a uh, horrendous, horrendous design. Again, like all the JVCs, I'm not a JVC fan of VCRs. JVC made a couple good things. They made uh, some, a few amplifiers that weren't too bad. Uh, they made some a few cassette decks, not many, but they made a few. TDV 1010 was one. That was a fantastic tape deck that they had. But for the most part, a lot of JVC stuff was just garbage. Just t total sheet, as they say. Uh, let me find where the test point is on this. I have no idea because they're not marked. Got the ICPs marked. It's the integrated circuit protectors like these things. They're marked on the board, but uh, I don't see any markings for test point. I ground here, video out, audio out. I'm looking for um, RF, playback color level, record uh, color. There should be test points on here. I'm just kind of looking to see if I can spot them because there should be some test points for checking the, um, the RF. I believe this is over here, playback RF. I think that's the one I'm looking for. So let's just uh, let's just clip my ground on here, somewhere, somewhere where I saw a ground. Playback FM is there. I can see that. That's uh, oh, that's the audio playback FM audio over here. So you guys can't see because the light is shining on it. But where's my ground? I saw a ground test point here. Ground, there we go. Ground, right there. All right. So let's look at the FM audio, which was that one. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. I'll get the other camera running. We'll find the, I gotta find the uh, test point for the, um, the switching point too. So we'll dig that one out. All right, I got my AFM on here. That's the audio FM. I'm clipped onto it over, over here. Uh, I don't even know where the where the um, the test point for the switching pulse is, the head switching. It's got to be one here somewhere. I'm just looking for it. Is it is it this one? Control pulse. Is that the one? Let's just see if it's this one. Uh, that's a control track pulse. I can trigger to that. Uh, okay, I'll go back to AFM and I will go over to the other one over here and we'll just trigger from that control track pulse. The one that is marked control pulse. We just need a, a, a reference. Okay, so we got a reference. Not a very good reference. Is it this one? There we go. All right, we got our reference. Now I can tweak the guides. And again, I'm using the AFM because it's a weaker signal. And we can just adjust the the exit side and the entrance side is over here and if I move my other probe over to the playback uh, RF right here much stronger signal off the video because the audio head is very very weak by comparison where are we here oh wrong <laughs> turning the wrong one there we go okay now we can see the video Right. And the exit guide. Do 
try to make that flat as possible, and the same with this one. I say ideally you use the AFM, which was that one. And the reason that we do that is, as I explained earlier, the um, I'm on the right one, aren't I? Maybe I'm on the right one. I've lost my test point. It's in here somewhere. Playback AFM right there. This is one right there. Um, the reason we like to use the AFM, as I explained before, is because the signal is much weaker just due to the fact that the uh, video has overwritten it just the way that the hi-fi works it records the hi-fi first and then the video is laid down over top of it and it erases a good portion of it but there's enough left there to recover this is also why uh, hi-fi machines the audio tends to get noisy before the heads wear out the picture still looks fine but the audio starts to drop out switch between hi-fi and normal which this one's doing because the hi-fi heads on here are probably just about shot um, but what happens when the signal gets to a below a certain level and also what happens on hi-fi tapes is as the tapes age the signal gets weaker and of course it gets much weaker on the hi-fi audio track before it gets weaker on the video track so I really get a good laugh when people say I use my VHS hi-fi to record music on because it sounds so good it sounds every bit as good as digital recording it sounds better um, okay great but it won't necessarily last because you're recording audio onto a tape and then you are going over top of it and you are wiping out 80% of the signal with a video signal. Some of the early hi-fi machines, Panasonic's um, PV1730, I think that was a model, I've got one. I should dig it out. It doesn't work. We'll fix it someday, but I've got one. It had a switch on it for audio only and the audio only switch did two things. One, it it set the servo to an internal reference as opposed to requiring an incoming video signal to reference the capstan and drum servo. It created its own internal reference. But two, it turned off the video amplifier, the video record amplifier, so that when it made the recording, it made the recording only on the hi-fi audio track and did not record a video track over top of it. So you didn't have that overwrite and wipe out a good portion of the audio hi-fi track while you were making your recording. It made for an interesting machine because uh, it could operate, use it just as a audio recorder. The caveat to that was tapes made on a machine like that that had an audio only mode was fine if you played it back on that machine but when you put it into a modern VHS machine that was expecting a video track half the time they would just give you a blue screen and mute the audio so people that use those machines that had the audio mode to make audio tapes you know six hour or eight hour music tapes they shot themselves in the foot when they went to play that tape back on another machine anyway this one has gone on way too long i'm into carlson's um marathon videos at this point and i i didn't intend this one to go on nearly as long as this i just wanted to show you guys some uh, ways to do your alignment using a scope because someone asked me about that I thought okay I'll do a video I'll do a short video on how to align with a scope and then I thought you know we need more than one machine because not every machine is the same I want to give you guys an idea of what to look for when you're looking at test points what waveforms to look for what you need to set up your scope with so we covered JVC, this one, we covered a Sony, we covered a Panasonic, we covered a Toshiba, we covered a Sony Beta, 
and the two eight millimeter machines both with the uh, and we got that beautiful tape eating session which I was completely unexpected and that got me by surprise but hey I get it I, I get an outtake from that to go on my opening logo so um, thanks for watching and uh, we will catch you in the next one I'll tell you what's coming up uh, because for those of you that watch my videos it chronologically I've got a, uh, a Denon CD recorder coming up. I've got a Sony reel-to-reel -reel mm -hmm. machine that the customer did some of their own work on it, but it's got a speed problem. Everything's going slow. So that was brought in to me to, to fix the speed problem. We'll be getting on that this week. And, uh, oh, I'm sure I'll find other stuff. But it, what's immediately coming up is a Denon CD recorder uh, and uh, a, a Sony reel-to-reel will be coming up and then i'm sure there'll be other stuff there will be because there's stuff coming in all the time but that's what's coming up in the next couple days thanks for watching we'll catch you next one bye